argue with what age you identify as. Um, you identify as six. Gotcha. All right. It's good to see everybody this morning. I hope you've been praying for Pastor Joe while he's been away. He's been up in Washington, D.C. and around and doing well and on his way back. So hopefully, hopefully he'll get in. I'm not sure what time he's going to get in. Mandy, do you know what time? About six. About six to nine. He's driving the bus back by himself. All right, because they went up to, it was a school function. They went up to Washington, D.C., part of an honors trip. And everything was so expensive. So he took the school bus, but he had to drive it up. Everybody else flew, flew up there and flew back, and he had to drive the bus up so he could, they could go around and see things, have something to go with. It was, the prices were unbelievable. It's just like everything else. They're expensive. So while he was away, he asked me to, to preach on him, preach on regeneration. Okay, now I want you to look at the, at the picture on the screen. Now, there's something wrong with that picture, all right? There's something wrong with what is said there. Now, I'm not going to tell you right now. We're going to come back to it at the end, okay? And when we come back to it, I'm going to ask you what's wrong with that, okay? So there is a test today. I'm sorry. You know, it's the teacher in me. What can I say? So in order to learn this, we're going to do it. But regeneration is uh, an act of God, all right? And it, it's one of those things that's it's a wonderful and mysterious act at the same time. Okay? Uh, it's one of those things that God does on our behalf. All right? When we couldn't do it, when we weren't able to respond in the way that he wanted us to, he did a work for us, in us, in order that we might respond in the way that he wanted us to. He responded in faith. Okay? And so... When we look at it, I mean, that, that was, that's what makes it such a magnificent thing, is the fact that God did this for us. Now, let's see if I can get this to work here, I think. All right. Yes. Let's see if I, there we go. Yeah. All right. So, when you look at regeneration, look at the first point. I tried to get it to where I could flip it in and out, you know, get it to fade in, fade out, and it... It just didn't work. So we're going, to look, we're going to get it all up there at once, so we'll take it one at a time, though. Look at the definition. Dr. Wayne Grudem says, Regeneration is the secret act of God in which he <coughs> imparts new spiritual life to us. Okay? You ought to memorize that. Because it's one of the greatest miracles that God has done for you and me. Apart from Christ dying on the cross and rising from the dead... Along that way, enabling him to do this, he imparts new life to us. Okay? Now that, that should get your exciter going already. Alright? If your Sunday hasn't been good up until now, it should be good now. Because, again, this is what God did. If you look, look down to the second point here, explanation and scriptural basis, regeneration, A, there is a, totally a work of God. Okay? God did this. You didn't do it. I didn't do it, you know. We weren't born with the faith to believe, right? We weren't born spiritually alive. We were born spiritually dead. And because of that, we were not in a position to respond in faith to the gospel as God would have us do it. Therefore, therefore, he imparted new life to us. He regenerated us. He gave us spiritual life so that we could respond, all right? So that he could we could respond. Now, I'm going to flip back and forth from slide to slide here a little bit. Hope I don't drive you crazy, but here's some scriptures to go along with that. All right? John 1.13. Those who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Okay? So John 1.13 says, we did nothing in our salvation, if you will. We did nothing. It says, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Okay? Look at Ezekiel 36, 20, 26 and 27. We look at the Old Testament, because even the Old Testament talks about a time when God would do something for mankind. He says here, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit that I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk 
in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So even in the Old Testament, when we wonder, what about the Old Testament times? Did God do it back then? Yes. Regeneration was there. Okay? In the New Testament time, regeneration was there. All right? So what does that mean? It means one thing. It means this. It means that people were saved in the Old Testament in the same way that they were saved in the New Testament. There was no difference. You all looking at me like, what happened? Is this... Is this, is this? <laughs> We'll, we'll just we'll keep going with it, all right? Keep after it. Keep hanging in there. Because what it means is, is that we, in the Old Testament, they put faith in the coming Messiah. And in order to be able to do that, God had to do a work in them so that they could believe. All right? Again, it all depends on where you start as to where you end up. We start with man being dead in his trespasses and sin, all right? And we're going to look at that in a minute. If we start there, then God's got to do something in order to resurrect us, to give us a new birth so that we can believe. So whether Old Testament, whether New Testament, or whether now, God's got to do a work in a man or a woman's heart so that we can believe and trust God, or it won't happen. It won't happen. And He does that. That's the amazing thing. Okay? That's the amazing thing, is that God does this. He could leave us, He could have left us alone. He could have said, listen, you sinned against me, and therefore, you know, I'm not, I, why, do I, why should I do this? Why should I give my son to die on the cross for you when you've done this to me? But he did. But he did. He sent his son to die for us. He rose from the dead in order that we might believe so that God can do this. Okay? I'm going to go back. All right. Look at number one under A. Scripture speaks of being born again, and that is totally a supernatural work of God. All right, we just looked at some of the scriptures. We're not going to look at them again. A supernatural work of God. That's the thing we've got to remember. In our day and age, everything tries to erase that from what's going on in church, okay? They don't see it. They don't see it that way. They don't see God in the same way that the Bible sees God. They don't understand God the same way that you and I, who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, understand Him. But salvation is a supernatural work of God. Man can't drum it up. We can't earn it. There's not enough money in the world for us to spend that we can get it, to purchase it. It just won't happen. God has to do a work in a man's heart in order for us to be saved. And everyone, everybody, everybody in here believes that. Because if we, if we talk about how do we pray for the lost, isn't that something that we pray? Don't we pray that God, you will change that person's heart and whoever you're praying for? We do. We believe that. We may not talk about it in these terms, but we believe that. And we trust that God's going to do that. We pray that God will do that. Okay? And so, that's what we say. Scripture speaks of being born again. And that it is totally a supernatural work of God. Alright? Now this, I'm going to take a minute here. A little time out from the sermon. This, this beautiful lady right here is my wife. Alright? Some of you have seen her before. She had memory issues. So, part of that is that she likes to walk. And so you see her walking up and down. She may walk up and come up and stand by me as I preach. But that's okay. Alright? That's okay. It works out fine. We'll just keep going. Alright, number two. In the Old Testament, God promised a future time when he would give new life to his people. We looked at Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. So we're not going to look at that again. But we understand that people are saved the same way in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was no different way. Faith in either the coming Messiah or the fact that he's already come and died for us. It's one or the other, but faith in that Messiah, Jesus Christ, when he would come. Number three, distinction between what I call effective calling and regeneration. Effective calling is God the Father speaking powerfully to us. Whether that's through a sermon, whether that's through you reading his Bible, whether that's through a gospel witness, talking with somebody, that is God using that. All right? Not talking to us through the preaching of the gospel, hearing the gospel. All right? We call it effective because when God calls, we come. All right? When God calls a person, they're going to come. He doesn't call a person and then they, then they don't come. That's not what effective calling is. Regeneration is God the Father and the Holy Spirit working powerfully in us to make us alive so that when He does call, we will respond. Okay? Now, when that happens, all right, we're not a robot. All right, think back to when you were saved. When that happened, all right, did you do it? Were you, were you screaming and shoving and saying, no, God, no, I don't want to do this, you know? 
No, we didn't do that. When God called us through the preaching of the gospel, we came. And we came willingly. We came because we wanted to. We came because we saw the need in our own life. And therefore, we asked God to save us. That's what regeneration does. He makes us alive so that we understand the need and we respond. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't respond. Okay? Now, it's also called irresistible grace. Because God effectively calls people and gives them regeneration. And both actions guarantee that we will respond to saving faith. And people still make voluntary, willing choice in responding to the gospel that we just talked about. Okay? So that when the gospel goes out, people respond. God is at work. Okay? God is at work. He's doing it all. But people are responding through the preaching of the gospel. Nothing else. Let me, let me, let me underscore that. I think everybody here knows that. But nevertheless... Let me, let me underscore that, that you cannot get saved apart from hearing the gospel either preached or shared with you in some form or fashion. It is the gospel that saves, nothing else. It is Jesus and his death on the cross and his resurrection that saves and nothing else. Okay? And that's what we're talking about here when we say that God effectively calls people and gives them regeneration. It has to come through the gospel. That's the only way. Okay? Let's go on. There's the scriptures again. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. You see verse 5 there when he says that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he made us alive together with Christ. <laughs> That's God doing this work of salvation. And that ought to cause us to rejoice. That ought to cause us to sing. It should put a smile on our face. It should lighten our step, lighten our load to some degree because we know that God did this for us when He did that. Alright. Point number two. The exact nature of regeneration is mysterious to us. Alright? For those of you who know Christ, do you did you know when God regenerated you? Did you feel it? Did you know when it happened? No. I'm telling you. I'm not even going to let you answer. The answer is no. <coughs> All right? We don't know when it happens, but it happens. All right? I'm, I'm, we're going to skip to the end here for a second. You know, you know how you know when it happens? Because you believe. Because you repented of your sins. Because you trusted Christ as your Savior. That's how we know it happened. All right? Until then, we don't know. We don't know. God does this work. It's a secret act of God in which he imparts new life. Okay? A secret act. All right? He doesn't tell us when it happens. We just know it. The person who, who has it happen to them believes, and the people around him sees the effect of it. So let's look. We go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. Okay? Now, when we talk about becoming spiritually alive, we're not just talking about our spirits being made spiritually alive. Every part of us is made alive. Okay? Every part, let me say that again. Some of you are thinking it through. Why do you think it's going to repeat? Every part of us is made alive. Not just our spirits. Not just our spirits. Okay? <coughs> Every part of us is affected by regeneration. I mean, we're going to skip ahead and look at the scripture. Ephesians 2 1 says, You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Ephesians 2 5, we read already, where he makes us alive. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Okay? You are a new creation. You are not what you were before you were saved. Okay? Let that sink in for a minute. We're going to go back to my outline. Let, let that sink in for a minute. You are a new creation. You are not what you were before you were saved. Okay? That's important for us to understand because many of us live as though we are still where we were before we were saved. And we're not living from the position that God has given us as being new creatures in Him with new power to live life. 
so that we can overcome those temptations that come our way, so that we can live for Him and do what He wants us to do. We are a new creation, and it is because of regeneration that this is true. All right? Now, I'm telling you, I'm trying to give you as much as I can to smile about today, and this is one of them to smile about today. All right? We are a new creation. You need, it's one of those things, I always like to keep things in front of me during the week as I go through it, because the week is rough enough, trying to get through seven days, you know, after six days after Sunday, but seven, get through the week. Now, this is one of those that you ought to put on your bathroom mirror, or your refrigerator door, whatever you look at the most, okay? And you ought to put up there, I am a new creation, and remind yourself every day, as many times as you can, that that is what you are. And you ought to live life that way. Live it as a new creation. Okay? Alright. Number three. Just as the wind has mysterious qualities, so too regeneration also shows us the result, even though we cannot see the act itself. John 3.8. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus there. You remember that conversation as it went on, that dialogue? John 3.8. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. All right? That's regeneration he's talking about there. Everyone who is born of the Spirit, regenerated by the Spirit, made alive by the Spirit. We don't know when it happens. It's like the wind blowing. We feel the wind. We see the effects of the wind. But we don't know where the wind comes from. We don't know the source of it. Same way with that act of God whereby he makes us alive. We don't necessarily feel it. We can't give you the time or the date. But we know it's happened because we see the effects of it. Okay? We see the effects of it. We are different. We are different. Alright? You are different. Not in an odd, queer kind of way. You are just different. We are in Christ. Okay? We are new creations. <coughs> While regeneration is an instantaneous event, it only happens once. The change will become evident over time. All right? Though we're a new cre creature, though we're a new creation, it's made alive in God. There's what we call the sanctification process in which God changes us, not all at once necessarily, but over time, right? You can say yes to this. Not a trick question. This, this is not going to be on the test. So you, you know, don't worry about that. Got another question that's going to be on the test. But God changes us over time. He makes us, He, he takes that, that, that creation that He started and He continues to make us more like Christ. Each and every day, each and every week, each and every month, we become more like Him. Alright? But regeneration begins that process. It only happens once. Alright? I got a I got a quote there. I got some quotes for you. I hope you'll like it as much as I like the quote. So you get the quotes that I like, so hopefully you'll like it. This one is by Gerhard Voss. He's an old theologian, German theologian. He says this, God gave us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Undoubtedly, this representation is chosen in order to emphasize the comprehensiveness and persuasiveness of the hope which the Christian obtains. It means a change as great as a crisis of birth, a transition from not being to living. When the hope of the gospel breaks upon our vision, the change is not partial. It does not affect our life in merely one or the other of its aspects. It revolutionizes our whole life at every point. What this means is a total regeneration of our consciousness, a regeneration of our way of thinking, a reversal of our outlook upon things entirely. And, and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Ain't that good? And I'm telling you, when God does it, He did it thoroughly. He changed everything. He changed everything. All right. Let's go on. See, in this sense of regeneration, it comes before saving faith. Number one, it is in fact this work of God that gives us a spiritual ability to respond to God in faith. All right? Just, again, just logically. We're not, we're not looking at anything. I'm just looking logically. If we are dead in our trespasses and sins, as Ephesians 2, 1 says, if that's where we start, if God has to make us alive so that we can respond in the way that He wants us to, then regeneration has to come before we put faith and trust in Christ. 
Everybody with me? Yeah, all right, good. Yeah, it has to be. It can't happen any other way. We're not born with faith. That faith doesn't lay dormant within us. It is not there. We are dead in trespasses and sin. We are sinners. And God makes us alive here. Number two, but it is often so close in time that it is hard to see how anyone could know about someone's regeneration unless it comes to expression in saving faith. Two things there. Number one, as we talk, we have, it, when we talk about regeneration and believing, it's not like regeneration happens on Monday, faith happens on Tuesday, sanctification starts on Wednesday. And we get it, it does, it's not like that. All right? It's not like that. What happens is it's like a horse race. And it's like a photo finish. You got regeneration and you got saving faith, and it, 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 it almost happens simultaneously, but not quite. But only a photo finish will show us which one comes in first. Okay? And that's the way it is. That's the way God works. He makes us alive and we believe. Again, when it's there, we jump on it. Until then, we don't. Alright? Have you ever have you ever talked with somebody who God is dealing with? They have an interest in the gospel. And they want to be saved. They, they, they kind of, you know, they know something is wrong, but they don't know what. They can't quite get their their mind around it. They can't crack, wrap their arms around it. And then all of a sudden, God opens their eyes, and they they say, "Now I see it," and they believe. You know, it's almost like in that same moment, God regenerates them, and then they believe. And in many ways, that's the way God works. Okay, we don't know when it happens, but we see the expression of it. All right, number three. Sometimes people talk about regeneration following saving faith, as we're talking about here. It can't happen. When that happens, we're, we're looking at the, the outward evidence of what's taking place on the inside. Okay? The emphasis focuses on the outward evidence, or the results. Yet the wording of Scripture uses regeneration as the instantaneous initial work of God in which He imparts spiritual life to us. John Calvin said this, Faith does not proceed from ourselves, but it is the fruit of Spiritual regeneration. Okay? So when we pray, know that when you pray and asking God to do a work in a person's heart that they might be saved, what you are asking them to do, what you're asking God to do is to regenerate them, to make them alive. So they can see their need and, and believe. Okay? Understand that's what you do. Nothing wrong with that. Alright? It's a good thing. It's a positive thing. And now you have a better understanding of what you're praying for, praying about and what God is going to do in the heart and life of those around you. All right, here's some scripture. Jesus answered in John 3, 5 and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, he was talking with Nicodemus there. Nicodemus didn't understand what he meant by that. So he said, unless you're born of water, natural birth, and the Spirit, regeneration, through the Spirit of God, you cannot <laughs> enter the kingdom of God. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. You see, we are, we are at the mercy of God for him to do something in us in order to save us. Okay? And so we've got to begin there. We've got to begin there. And I, I'm going to apply all this in some, hopefully, some very practical ways for you guys here. Acts 16, 14. This is a story about Lydia. You remember this? It says one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. All right? So for Lydia, she was a worshiper. She was a Gentile. She was a worshiper of God. God opens her heart to respond to Paul's message about Jesus Christ and the gospel. And she responds. All right? Everyone in here who knows Jesus Christ is a Savior. That's what happened to you and to me. That's what happened to me. All right? In my testimony, I had no idea what it meant to be saved. Okay? I was a church goer. I went to church with my wife, and I went to church almost every Sunday. But we had no clues of what it meant to be saved. God opened our hearts, and we got saved. Okay? Changed our lives forever. They haven't been the same since we got saved. All right? I mean, I can tell you that the very next morning after I got saved, I got saved on a Sunday night, that next morning I was waiting for a ride to work, and I knew God was with me. All right? I was sitting outside all by myself, but God was there. God was there. All right? It was different. 
It was different. I knew God was there. God changed my life. All right. Let's look at this then for a few minutes. Some application. We got more than just this. But genuine regeneration then must bring results in life. Okay? Hear me. If God makes you alive and changes your life, there's going to be evidence. And if there is no evidence, there is no life. It's that simple. I'm not trying to be hard here, but it is a fact. <coughs> I don't want any confusion to be going on. If there's no results that God has saved you, nothing has changed, then there's no life in you. Alright? The Bible says in 1 John 2, 29 and 3, 9, that we cannot go on sinning. In fact, I don't have scriptures for this because I want us to look at it. If you have your Bible here, you have your iPad here, your phone, turn in your Bibles or turn on your phones and go to 1 John chapter 2. And stay there. Every, every scripture I give right now is going to be in 1 John. So look at 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 29. We're going to read these together because I want you to see them. All right? I want you to see them. This is important. 1 John 2, 29 says this. If you know that he is righteous, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness has been fathered by him, has been born of him. Actual idea there means to be fathered. Okay? So he says there, John said, who, the one who practices righteousness. Right? The idea that we cannot go on sinning. Look at chapter 3, verse 9. Right now, a few verses. Everyone who has been, everyone who has been fathered by God or born of God does not practice sin because God's seed resides in him. And thus he is not able to sin because he has been born or fathered by God. Alright? God says that when you are saved, his seed resides in you, and therefore your life has changed. That's why I said we are a new creation. And the result of that is not sinless perfection. All right, understand me here. I'm not saying that we have to be, sin be perfect. But the practice of our lives cannot be that of constantly sinning. Okay? That can't be the bent of our hearts. If it is, there's something wrong. Okay? There's something wrong. Because if we have been <coughs> changed and made a new creation, and God resides in us, and we're not going to be the same. We're not going to act the same. We're not going to live the same. We're going to struggle. Don't get me wrong. We're going to struggle. All right? Things aren't always going to go perfect. But we will repent of our sin. We will move on from there. We do our best not to sin. Because sin, sin at this point in your life, in my life, it ought to be a, it ought to be an irritant. When we do, it ought to nag us. It ought to bother us that we did it. All right? And if, if, there is, if that isn't there, then there's something wrong. Because the Holy Spirit's going to, his job is to convict us of what? Of sin and of righteousness. And if he lives in us, then that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Okay? Now, second thing is a Christ-like love. Turn to 1 John chapter 4. Turn over one chapter, verse 7. Verse 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. Alright? The very earmark of a Christian is love. Love for one another. Love for the world around us. Love for God. Love is at the center of what should be going on in your life and my life. Okay? Love ought to be there. Because that, what is, in 1 John it says God is what? God is love. That's right. And if God is love and He <coughs> resides in us, then the expression of God in us should be one of love. Okay? And where there isn't any love, there isn't God. Can't be there. Can't be there. Okay? So, the other thing, overcoming the world. 1 John chapter 5. Go one chapter over. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verses 3 and 4. Okay? Overcoming the world. 1 John 3 and 4. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments do not weigh us down. 
Because everyone who has been fathered by God conquers the world. And this is the conquering power that has conquered the world, our faith. Our faith. Alright? And the word for conquer there <coughs> in 1 John is where we get our word Nike. Okay? And Nike means victory. It means to conquer. It means conqueror. Alright? And so what 1 John is saying is that it is faith that helps us to overcome or conquer the world around us. Alright? Because there is a battle going on there in that sense, between the world around us because we're Christians. Alright? We're no longer, we're, we're strangers here in this world now. Okay? God has transferred us to His kingdom over here. The world is over here, but we're over here. And we're to live out of this kingdom, not out of this one. We're no longer friends here. We're passing through. We have one mission, now that we're here, that's to take the gospel of God's kingdom and get it to the world here so that they might hear and be saved as well. See, that's what love does. You and I both know what it means to be forgiven, and therefore it should give us a heart for those around us, and we should show it by how we live. Alright? When people look at you and me, in all honesty, our lives should be different, not by how we dress, or how we wear our hair, or different things like that, but how we live it so that people look at it and say, you know, that, that Al, he's a weird guy. <laughs> There's something strange about him, you know? And that's good weirdness. Nobody likes to be weird, right? Especially when we're teenagers, and even now as adults, we don't like to be weird. But in that sense, it's a good thing. All right? We should be weird. People look at us and say, I don't know where he's from, but he's not from around here. He doesn't, he, you know, he's not one of us. That's right. You're right. I'm not. I'm not. I belong to God, and therefore I live for him, and that makes my life different. I want to respond differently. Okay? You're going to try and tell me things, and I'm going to say, no, I'm sorry. I had, had a guy try to tell me over the weekend, or Friday, that God is an avatar. And I said, I'm sorry, God is not an avatar. <laughs> you know, you don't understand what that means. I'm sorry. You know. So, we overcome the world. There's victory there for us because God has made us alive, and therefore we live life by faith, and therefore we can conquer the world. All right? Number four, protection from Satan. Look at 1 John chapter 4. Look back one, one, one chapter. We'll look there and then we'll go back to verse, chapter 5. Look at verse 4. He says, You are from God, little children, and have conquered them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You look at 1 John 5, 18. It says that we know that everyone fathered by God does not sin, God protects the one in his father, and the evil one cannot touch him. Okay? So we have protection. God is not going to let anything happen to us. Alright? Satan is not allowed to touch us unless God gives him permission, just like he did with Job. Alright? So this world can try and do its best to hurt us, to harm us, to intimidate us, to do what it wants. But we can look at it and smile and say, that's alright. God is with me, and therefore, you can't touch me. Do what you want. Do what you want. And if you want to read, listen, if you want to challenge yourself at this level, there is uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. How many of you are familiar with that? Right? Voice of the Martyrs, they put out books that you can get free, most of them. And you can read the stories of those in other countries and some of the persecution that they are going through to see how God sustains them even in those difficult times. Okay? Be ready to be humble because you will. When you see what they go through and how they put their faith and trust in God and how God sees them through it, even though it's a difficult time, you'll see that what we're going through is nothing. It's nothing compared to something. Okay? God protects us. He takes care of us. The fruit of the Spirit. Alright? Galatians 5, 22-23. I'm not going to have us read that. Most of us in here can probably quote that. Matthew 7, 15 through 20 talks about that time when Jesus will come back and he'll say to some, depart from me, I never knew you. And they're going to respond and they're going to say, but didn't I do this? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I work miracles in your name? Didn't I? And Jesus is going to say, 
I never knew you. See, it's not about what we do. It's about what God has done in us. Okay, Satan can, Satan can masquerade. He can counterfeit those miracles. Did he do it in, in, with Pharaoh? In Pharaoh's court with Moses? Satan can do that. He can deceive us. He can deceive a person and making them believe that they are somebody special because they can do great things. Number six, then. These results are character traits, not church activity or even miracles. Therefore, number seven, it is impossible for a person to be regenerated and not become truly converted. You are either all in or all out. Our salvation is not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. There can be no justification and doesn't issue in sanctification as well. And that was from B.B. Warfield. Uh, he was a great theologian back in the, in the late, late 1800s, 1900s, early 1900s. Um, one of the best around. You can still get his books, and I would highly recommend you get him to read them. He was good. Charles H. Spurgeon said this, If you are renewed by grace and were to meet your old self, I am sure you would be very anxious to get out of this country. All right? All right? And he said that though tongue-in-cheek because it should be true. We don't want to see our own. We don't want to be our own selves. Why would we want to go back to being what we were when God has changed us? All right? So when we see our old self, it should cause us to go in the other direction. All right. Let's see. we got another quote for you. It says this, in modern-day evangelism... <coughs> Paul Washer here says, in modern day evangelism, this precious doctrine of regeneration has been reduced to nothing more than a human decision to raise one's hands. Walk an aisle or pray a sinner's prayer. As a result, the majority of Americans believe that they've been born again, even though their thoughts, words, and deeds are a continual contradiction to the nature of the will of God. See, that, that's the bottom line in all this. Okay? I come back. I'm, I know I sound redundant. I don't want to put anybody to sleep here. I'm sorry if I do. But nevertheless, if, if we say that God has made us alive and our lives haven't changed, there's no life there. There's no life there. Something is wrong. Okay? Something is wrong. When I, when I went to school in Texas, my wife and I had the opportunity to minister to a man. His name was John Paul. And he was an alcoholic. Okay? He used to come around my work, where I work all the time. I was a shipping clerk at the time, and he would come to my back door. And the first time I met him, he had a cut in his hand, he cut his hand, so I bandaged it up for him. And we became friends. He used to come to my, my place all the time. We would talk. And uh, I told him on a three-day weekend one time, I said, you'll sober up, clean up, and so I'll take you home. And you spend the weekend with me and my wife. All right? Lo and behold, that Friday, the end of the day, he showed up. Sober and cleaned up. So I took him home. He spent the weekend with me, and I got to talk to him. And one of the things I kept doing is I kept trying to share the gospel with him. And one time, finally, he looked at me and says, he said, Al, I am saved. And I said, well, John Paul, if you are saved, there's something wrong. Because saved people don't go out and drink their lives with their life. Right? He could talk, talk. He knew what it was all about. Whether he was saved or not, I don't know. I tried to get him help. And uh, I got him into a place you know, to which he ran away from and uh, came back and told me that he left. He said he didn't like, didn't like groups, so he, he ran away. So I, I don't know what his spiritual condition was or where it ever ended up. I got to know his family through it all, and hopefully they, they were able to minister to him. But I'm just telling you, if there's, no, if there's life, and if, if your life changes, you don't live the same way. And only you know that. I don't know that. Okay? I don't know what's going on in your heart and in your life. You know that. I, I can only answer for me. Okay? But I know this is true. What Paul Washer said. You know, it, it, there's got to be a changed life. There's got to be a changed life. We've got to be different. God lives in us. We cannot be the same if God lives in us. All right, so what? Then, so what? Number one. If a person is born again, regenerated by God, then a changed life must follow. Where there is no changed life, there is no salvation. Where there is no salvation, there will be no heaven. Okay? 
There's no way to get into heaven apart from God making you alive and making you a member of His kingdom. That's it. The second thing is, the answer to changing our world is for God to save people, to regenerate them in order that their lives will be changed. That's the only way that our world is going to be different. That's the only way to make our world better. All right? It's the only way for the United States to be better. All right? The United States, it's in chaos right now. It's in chaos. What people believe and how people act and what they're doing, all right? it's nuts. Right? It's nuts. Don't say yes to that because it is. It's nuts. All right? They don't believe the gospel. They don't believe the gospel. God has no part in what's going on. All right? Because if He did, we wouldn't be doing the things we're doing as a nation. All right? But we are. But the only thing that's going to change our world is to get the gospel message out and for other people like you and like me to tell those around us and see God. Do a grassroots movement. Forget about our government leaders. Pray for them. Don't get me wrong. Pray for them. But, but that's not what's going to change the world. We need God to bring revival. We need God to do a work in our day, just like He's done in the past, where the gospel begins to spread and lives are changed because the gospel is preached. That will change the United States of America. And I believe God will still do that. I don't believe we're beyond that. I believe God will do it if we ask Him to do it. But here's the thing. If we ask Him to do it, then He's going to ask you to help out. Okay? If you ask Him to do this, and we should, then He's going to give you opportunities to witness to people and to share the good news. And we need to be willing to do that. And if we're willing to do that, then God will change the world. He'll take this group right here, and He'll turn Newport Richie upside down. Right? But it's whether or not we have confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ to do this. All right? One of the things I think about the church today, one of the reasons why the church seems to be impotent is because the people of, of God don't have confidence that God will do what He says. All right? Because if, if we believed it, we would be telling people. All right? The fact that we're not is because we don't really believe that God will change lives. All right? The quote down here, Lewis Berry Chaper was uh, president of Dallas Theological Seminary uh, back in the day. He's, he's no longer alive. It says this, the satanic message for this age will be reformation and self-development, while the message of God is regeneration by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's right where we're at, isn't it? It is. When you think about what's going on these days, when you talk about reformation and self-development, that's what you hear in the news, that's what you hear in our colleges, and our universities, that's what you are hearing everywhere. And that is a lie from Satan to make people feel good and to miss the gospel. Right? And not have any real substantial change. But missing it. You and I have the answer. And the question I'm going to leave you with is, I don't think I have any more quotes. No, that's it. <laughs> the question I'm going to leave you with is, are you willing to trust God with your life and ask Him to change our world? Again, be ready. If you do, He will ask you to help out. He will give you opportunities to be a part of that. And there's nothing greater in this world that we can be a part of and help you. And helping him by just preaching the gospel and letting him do the work and seeing lives change. Nothing more exciting than that. So, we're going to end here. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And then we'll be dismissed. So, let's see. Well, wait. I